This next lady, Rebecca Long Bailey, has been MP here in Salford and Eccles since last year's general election. She also supported Jeremy last summer and she's recently become Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. She's also, like Richard, a woman of integrity and principle. <laughs> I'm delighted that she's your MP here, and I'm delighted to be able to call Rebecca a friend. So Rebecca, you're very welcome here today. that we've just heard tonight, but I'll give it a crack and see how we get on. So um, I want to thank you all for coming today to Salford, capital of the North, and <laughs> paradise on Earth. Now we're in turbulent political times, we know that. In the new Prime Minister's speech to the nation, she said that when we take the big calls, we'll think not of the powerful, but you. And we all know it's complete rubbish. <laughs> she also confirmed quite clearly that she is pro-austerity and she's much more ideologically to the right than David Cameron, so much so that she's going to make David and George look like Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. <laughs> an MP like me because I know that the most vulnerable are going to suffer horrific imaginable um, suffering and our local services who are already on the brink of collapse are going to be pushed over the edge of a cliff and if we give her a few years in power then quite frankly this government will destroy everything that our labour movement has fought for. The struggle, the blood, sweat and tears of our ancestors all for nothing and our children are going to have to fight those battles all over again. Yes. Now people have lost faith in politics and it's not hard to understand some of the reasons why vast swathes of people in my constituency of Salford and Eccles voted so passionately in the referendum. Leavers and Remainers voted in the belief that they were playing some small part in rebuilding Britain because the government wasn't doing it for them. And it's no wonder they were angry with the political establishment when the financial situation of all income groups across the North have suffered horrifically. And here in Salford, we know how that has panned out. We've suffered decades of industrial decline. And when I was out and about, I could feel how angry people were and they were right to be angry. They were right to be angry that our hospitals and schools were being starved of funding. Our local authorities were having their budgets cut so they couldn't even provide the most basic of services anymore. They were right to be angry to see people on the streets of Manchester and Salford sleeping rough and being moved on. They were angry that our public services were being savagely cut so that the safety net that people rely on was being eroded. And they wanted somebody to blame, of course they did. But unfortunately, this was confused in the rhetoric of a lot of the referendum campaigns and a race-related hornet's nest was stirred up instead of telling people the real reason why our economy isn't working. It's not immigration, it's the fact that it's being exploited by a select few. <laughs> I was at the um, Salford Poverty Truth Commission launch. Yes. Yeah, which is a, it's a group that we started in Salford to examine all the different facets of poverty and the, and the horrific things that people experience in their lives. And we had 15 people standing up on the stage who had real guts and courage and told an, an audience of the horrific things that they had experienced and what poverty meant to them. And I heard tales of those who had suffered terrible childhoods, 
who turn to alcohol and drugs to numb the pain in the absence of counselling, but with cuts to mental health provision, there was no support for them. I heard from families on the breadline unable to afford to heat their homes. I heard from those who would probably class as better off, people that had been to university with well-paid jobs, but they were struggling, crushed by a mountain of household debt. And I heard a story about a family hiding behind the sofa when the bailiffs came to call, the children frightened out of their minds, being told to be quiet as mice. Now, many of you know that Ellis Lowry was, um, in fact, a rent collector in the 1920s, and he was knocking on doors just like these, and he tried to use his experiences to shape what he, pictured, what he painted on canvas. But what would he say if he knew that in 2016, families were going through the same agony as they were in the 1920s? This economy is not working. <laughs> when Margaret Thatcher came to power and it heralded the biggest change in economic thought this country has ever seen, the neoliberalist economic school of thought. And we saw British manufacturing across the northwest and throughout the country and the well-paid, secure jobs that went with them being sent overseas, outsourced. We have the heart and soul ripped out of British manufacturing before our very eyes. And we were told that it was all going to be all right. All the wealth was going to be sucked up to the top and eventually it would trickle back down to us and we'd all have a piece of the pie. Well, it never happened, did it? Communities up and down the country were destroyed, leaving the shattered pieces to be picked up for generations to come. And the children today sometimes don't understand that the financial hardship and the lack of opportunity that they're experiencing today all has its origins in 1979. <laughs> now, there was a failure by successive governments to really restructure our economy and a failure to develop an industrial strategy to support key industries outside the finance sector. And quite frankly, there was a failure to produce a plan to make our country great, and a failure to ensure that the British people enjoy a good quality of life no matter where they came from. And that, my friends, is the role of government. industrial world and I saw the poverty and the insecurity all around me and I became disillusioned with politicians and I saw my own Labour Party tinker about with a few things here and there but never make any really bold changes that would really change society and I also sadly saw them embrace a form of economic thought embraced by Thatcher that I knew was fundamentally flawed. I'd had enough and I wanted to become an MP to represent communities that needed help and I knew something in our party had to change because it wasn't delivering that for people. I wanted to build a Labour Party that really represented my community, a party that wasn't afraid to say it was socialist. <laughs> saying the word socialist too much. But on day one, I was inspired by two men who truly knew what the word socialism meant. Two men who are like no other politicians I have ever met since Tony Benn. Two men... <laughs> two men are so decent 
absent and kind. They embody the selfless profession that politics should be. And those two men are Jamie Corbyn and John McDonnell. when Jeremy was addressing the <laughs> An event which is um, really, really steeped in the history of our movement. An event which the likes of Blair and Brown shamefully shunned. And I'm sure you will all join me in sending our condolences to the family of Davy Ho Hopper. Um, he was a giant of all of you who sadly passed away. And after Gala, Renee and Gerardo from the Miami Five were also there. <laughs> he subsequently visited Parliament and Jeremy was criticised for spending time with them instead of Theresa May. <laughs> well, friends, I know who I've got to spend time with. <laughs> and they say, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more and become more, you are a leader. And with our party membership, well over half a million, with more than 183,000 people signing up in a 48 hour period, which by the way is more than the whole of the Tory membership. I know, and you know, that the search for the Labour Party leader and our next Prime Minister is well and truly over. 
Friends, I give you Jeremy Corbyn. sympathy and our thoughts to the families of those that lost loved ones in that deadly attack last night. We should also praise the emergency services in Munich that responded so swiftly, so effectively and so quickly to help those people, as do emergency services all over the world. They are the people we need and we rely on at all times. We should also say quite simply that many of these attacks are designed to drive a wedge between communities. They did not succeed in London on 7-7 or in Nice and they will not succeed in Munich. A year ago, thousands of people, citizens of Munich, lined the streets with flowers, food and drink to welcome Syrian refugees. A city that can show such compassion will never allow itself to be torn apart by these kind of acts. It's keeping communities together, which is the most important thing that we can do. Here, in Salford, in the northwest, there is an enormous sense of that strength of community. In this theatre here this afternoon, we have 2,000 people. We have people following us uh, around the country as our um, developing technology will <laughs> explain to you. Um, and we also have many, many thousands following us on Facebook and online. It's the form of communication that is so important that is available to us. But it's also important to understand how our culture and our values came about. I'm very proud to be here in the Lowry Theatre. I'm a great admirer of the works of Ellis Lowry, a working class artist who portrayed working class life, who told the world what it was like to be poor, to be threatened with eviction, to lose your position, your status in life. The rich tapestry of working class culture that is so often ignored by so-called highbrow culture within our society. So, Lowry painted it like he saw it. Lowry painted it like it was. Another great person, great citizen from Salford, Walter Greenwood, wrote Love on the Dole. His description of the way in which desperately poor families their money taken away from them by the means test during the 1930s. Pawned their valuables with the pawnbroker. They couldn't afford to redeem them a week later. So they then had to pay interest on the loan in the first place. Then a week later, they still couldn't afford to redeem their goods. So they re-pawned them with even more interest. So they discovered themselves paying interest upon interest upon interest. That was in the 1930s. Is that so different to the payday loan companies today, where people borrow from them in order to try and get through that week? <laughs> Lowry, 
Walter Greenwood, many, many others have shown us the importance of understanding the function and the connection between literature, between art and culture. One of the former MPs for Salford, a great friend of mine, Frank Alorn, often talked to me about this and how you bring those things together. And I learnt a great deal from Frank Alorn. And the issue surely is what we're here for as a movement. We're not here to offer a contract with anybody. We're here, surely, because Labour believes in the empowerment of people and drawing on all that imagination, all those ideas that come from such a rich tapestry of our own history and of our own current. The art might be different now, but the principle is the same, of artists seeing it like it is, telling it the way they see it, and the rest of us understanding something from that. Be it poetry, be it painting, be it rap, be it dance, or anything else. Never be afraid of embracing culture with politics and politics with culture. The two things go together. It's about unleashing the imagination and ideas that are there in so many people. And so many of those ideas and imagination are restricted or corralled by the poverty of circumstances and the lack of opportunity to develop them. Our constitution says to create a society in which the power, wealth and opportunity are in the hands of the many, not the few. I absolutely believe that. That is what's so strong about our country. And our membership has surged as others have explained, as Richard and Becky have explained to you, with a membership now over half a million. 540,000 was reported to the National Executive last week. More than the combined membership of every other political party in Britain. And when I explain these figures to a meeting of socialist parties from all over Europe in Paris two weeks ago, they asked for a retranslation. They didn't believe the figures that I'd given. I explained to them that it was absolutely true. We also have three million affiliated trade unionists, as well as the 180,000 registered supporters in just 48 hours last week. We are... We are... A social movement, and we will only win the next general election because we are that movement of people all around the country who want to see a different world and do things very differently. Some people, some people who um, are very respected commentators, and I'm sure they understand these things extremely well, I'm sure far better than any of us do, say that that isn't how politics is done and that it is solely what happens in Parliament that's important. Now don't misunderstand me, what happens in Parliament is very, very important. That is why many of us have sought office in Parliament in order to effect those changes. But changes come because people want those changes to come and Parliament has to influence in the way that those changes come about. And we have to learn from the past. Richard pointed out the sadness and the disaster that we suffered of two general election defeats in 2010 and 2015. That tells me something. We cannot go on as we were before. We cannot be a party that equivocates on issues of welfare, that cannot be a party that equivocates on the effects of austerity on the poorest and most marginalised people within our society. We have to, and we will, do politics, do economics, do social justice differently as a way of exciting and mobilising. I was 
very proud to be elected to this position a year ago. It's not about individuals. It's actually about the ideas, the thirst of a whole new agglomeration of people, young, old, all communities, all ideas coming together in order to achieve something better and different within our society. We have become a mass party and a mass organisation. That is something we can be very, very proud of. Electoral success is never a given, it's hard work. It's an expression of people's views and wishes, but it's also an expression of their determination to see something different. I was very proud when we won the mayoral elections in Liverpool, when we won the mayoral election in London, despite the most disgusting, scurrilous campaign I've ever seen run by the Tory party against the Tory party. And I was very proud to go many times to Bristol to support and campaign alongside Marvin Rees and the incredible victory that he achieved as Mayor of Bristol. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Paul Dennett here today, the elected Mayor of Salford. Paul, thank you for coming and congratulations on your great victory. I'm going to tell you something now, you won't have read in any of the papers because they, none of them had any space to carry it whatsoever because they're very, very busy with all the important news of the day. But I'll let you know, on Thursday night, which is only 36 hours ago, so the news should have got through by now, there was a by-election in the district of Thant in North Kent, in Ramsgate. A by-election in which the Labour candidates... Penny Newman, took the seat from UKIP and won it for Labour. <laughs> and I was very proud to find her on Thursday night and congratulate her. And you won't have read this in any of the other papers, that uh, on Thursday we also won, as far as I know, with increased majorities in most cases, if not all of them, seven other council violations on Thursday. Now, I don't underestimate the mountain we have to climb to win a general election, which is why this leadership election is also about building the technology, the ideas, the campaigning skills and the inclusive way we do things into a movement that can and will win a general election. We have three times as many members as we had a year ago. In fact, we're all leaders. We're leaders in the community, leaders in the workplace, college, university, church, mosque, synagogue, gurdwara or temple. We're all active and leaders within our community. And we're also all messengers for the ideas we want to put forward and the kind of society that we want to achieve. The media, the mass media, the Murdoch and media and others, they're not going to do it for us. It's up to us to reach out and do it. that the owners of some of our media who um, are forced to live in tax havens elsewhere because of the onerous nature of the taxation system in this country and their companies are forced to be registered in tax havens elsewhere because they're not particularly willing to pay taxes in this country yet quite prepared to criticise us for not having the resources available because they don't pay their taxes in the first place. So we have to do it ourselves because unity is what will achieve it. It's bringing together the members of our party, the members of our unions, and all the affiliates, councillors, MPs, MEPs, mayors, and others. It's bringing people together that will get this very strong message about 
the social justice that we're determined to achieve in this society. I want to say this. We have to be very disciplined about what we do. I make it clear today, as I've made it clear many, many times before. I don't do any personal abuse of anybody at any time ever. I don't, I don't respond to it because I'm not prepared to lower the level of debate to that sort. None of that has any place in our party or our movements. I know people are angry about actions that have been taken, but where there are disagreements in our party, we settle them through democratic means. No coups, no intimidation, no abuse. And whatever the result on the 24th of September, we're going to be a united movement to take on the Tories and take on the ideology that they're forcing on people of this country. And people who say that somehow or other the last 10 months has not been particularly successful, I just remind them, it was the Labour movement coming together that forced them back on cutting working families' tax credits. Three million families have not had a thousand pounds taken from them. When George Osborne, in the middle of his budget, apropos not very much, suddenly said PIPs are going to go, personal independence payments to give those with disabilities some dignity and independence in life, the anger was so palpable, the opposition was so strong, they were forced to retreat in less than three days on that. Say to the new Chancellor of Exchequer, Mr. Hammond, don't you dare come back with an autumn statement that takes the pips away again. We are not having it. We will stand by those pips and stand by the justice of our society. And then, again, almost apropos of nothing, like it was a sort of add on to the budget. George Osborne suddenly headed off in a rather odd direction of discussing education policy. I thought he was a chance of the Exchequer, but obviously he had uh, ideas slightly above his station, and um, decided that every school should become an academy. Forced academisation, breaking up uh, collective bargaining arrangements, setting schools in competition with each other, rather than the family of schools at a local level cooperating with each other to improve the lives and opportunities of the The teachers unions came out very quickly against it. We came out very quickly against it. An awful lot of people came out very quickly against it. Sure. They're to abandon the whole idea. Not very much. So in these, uh, in these skirmishes that we win, we learn lessons. We learn two lessons. One is the power of opinion, the power of mobilisation, the power to achieve things together. But we also learn how we can do things differently in the future. I don't want a primary school to see the primary school half a mile down the road as its competitor. I don't want to see a secondary school to say the other secondary school on the other side of town is its big rival. They can have rivalry at a football match if they want, that's fine. But I want there to be the family of education at the local level that supports every single student. <laughs> every single student. our young people to grow up understanding the values of cooperation. It also means you can provide collectively better sports facilities, music, art, culture, theatre, dance, drama, science, engineering, all those things you can do together. That's what's a strong message. And 
Cambridge Way campaigns against student debt, and I'll come back to that in a moment, and against the rising tide of homelessness and destitution in this country. There is something deeply appalling and wrong that in one of the top four or five richest countries in the world, somehow or other, we tolerate the idea there are homeless people. I travel around the country a lot, and I talk to many people in lots of circumstances. And I talk to people who are sleeping on the streets, who are begging money to pay for the night shelter, and all that. You talk to them about their lives. There's been disasters, there's been tragedies, there's been mistakes, there's been bad things happened to them. All kinds of problems have come about. And they face life on the streets. And sadly, some of them die on the streets. And people say to me, well, Jeremy, you know, you're too involved in all that kind of stuff. You know, you should recognise that it's only the middle ground that matters in politics. I just say this, surely in politics and in life, there is a moral imperative of what you do. If you're reasonably well paid, <laughs> if you're reasonably well paid, if you've got a reasonable job, you've got somewhere nice to live, and you know, life's kind of more or less okay, are you really happy? When you walk home and you walk past beggars and homeless people, are you really happy knowing that somewhere else there's children living in grossly overcrowded, damp, unsafe accommodation? No, you're not. Humanity actually reaches out wanting to help each other. Why can't we translate that into the political agenda that we've got forward as well? We don't allow homelessness to rise or those with disabilities facing the work capability assessment tests to be so demonised because they do it. Surely we can do things better and differently within our society. We launched our campaign on Thursday and I set out then the scandal of uh, unequal pay within our society. The Equal Pay Act was first passed in 1970, and there is still a 20% gender pay gap in our society. It's got to be close. <laughs> I was very pleased when John McDonnell, in dealing with the first budget he had to face as Shadow Chancellor and his team, including Richard and Becky, set out the gender effects of the budget, set out the environmental effects of the budget, showed what is really happening in society because of the economic decisions being taken by that budget. So I want to say a big thank you to John McDonnell for changing the whole economic debate within our society. He's called Austerity Act for what it is, a political choice, not an economic necessity, and pointed out that we achieve far more by investing. You can't cut your way to prosperity, you grow your way to prosperity. Now, two weeks ago on the um, steps of Downing Street, Theresa May stood there and um, expressed deep concern about the state of society. And I'm very grateful to her for doing that. <laughs> it was very kind of her to do it. She seemed to forget that she's actually been a member of the Cabinet for six years, that has presided over rising poverty, personal debt, and inequality within our society. <laughs> and then, as if to uh, ensure that that um, an interesting moment outside Downing Street would swiftly be consigned to the dustbin of history. She then introduced a higher education bill which will encourage yet more privatisation in education, saddle our students with deeper and deeper debt, higher and higher fees, and drive many 
from poor and working class communities away from the opportunities of university education. Angela Rayner called them out brilliantly on this in Parliament. Thanks, Angela, for what you said and what you did. Surely the point to understand is that young people who do training, do good apprenticeships, get good qualifications, go to college, go to university, get a degree, become engineers, become doctors, become nurses, become transport experts, all the other things they can become. Of course they individually benefit, but we as a whole all benefit from it. We all benefit from their skills. And the skills they have learned would help us all. These victories that we've won in Parliament are because of public outrage and because people campaigned and united together on this. Our NHS was founded by a Labour government with real vision, by a Secretary of State in RN Devon with the most amazing vision, a National Health Service free at the point of use as a human right. It's under threat. It's under threat from the Health and Social Care Act, it's under threat from privatisation, it's under threat from underfunding, and it's under threat from the rationing of medicines by some of our local um, commissioning groups. It seriously is under threat. And I thank Diane Abbott for the great work that she's done on this and is doing on this. And also pointing out that in addition to the need to properly fund our NHS and ensure that the NHS staff are employed by the National Health Service, not by private contractors, and properly paid and remunerated to do it. She's also pointing out the levels of health inequality. Why is it you live longer if you live in the most wealthy parts of Cheshire than if you live in central Salford or central Manchester. Why is the same thing applied in Glasgow or in London or in Birmingham or anywhere else? The grotesque levels of health inequality, life expectancy, likelihood of getting uh, serious conditions, cancer, heart conditions or anything else seem to be partly related to postcode and your wealth. Surely this is an issue we have to address. And I would like to see somebody with the compassion and heart of Diane Abbott as the Secretary of State, rather than somebody who only wants to try to and blame the junior doctors for what they're trying to do. I want to thank all of you for all that you do campaigning, all of your campaigning for social justice and environmental justice. Because, as I've tried to set out in the few remarks I'm making today. What we do is about economic justice. It is about empowerment of people. It is about giving young people hope. It is about ensuring that older people are treated with respect and dignity and, if necessary, given the support that they want. But it's also about our attitude to the rest of the world. Our human rights issues, internationally as well as nationally our attitude towards the natural world and the environment, so that we recognise the sustainability arguments ought to be central to politics, not just an add-on to our politics. <laughs> and our party is changing. Politics is changing, and it needed to change. You are that change. You are the ones that will change politics. And I want to make sure that people are empowered to do it. Because politics isn't about sending great individuals somewhere else to do great things and then come back and tell you how difficult it was not to do them. <laughs> Surely it's better if we empower people together to ensure that that's it, that inexorable pressure to give us the health service we need, to give us the housing strategy that doesn't consign people to overcrowding and homelessness, that is an industrial policy that pays people properly, invests properly, and ensures there is real job security, not the horrors that we've seen of Mike Ashley 
and Sport Direct. As an example, having one practice in the afternoon. And so, our campaign is about tackling the five great ills in our society. The five great ills that we face in our society. Inequality, insecurity, prejudice, discrimination and neglect. Surely our purpose, the whole reason we're here today, we come into politics, we activate ourselves in our communities, is because we want to build a society in which no one, but no one, is left behind. And no community is left behind. We want an investor, we want a housing, we want a work. And it's a vision of how we do things. We can only do things and only achieve things when we do it together. That is our message. That is our strength. That is our strength. Thank you so much for inviting me here today.